Throughout the entire Xehanort saga, I always felt like we had a decent idea about the goals of both the heroes and the villains. Sora wanted to save his friends, and did his best to help everyone he met along the way. Riku made mistakes, but then sought redemption, putting Sora's well-being over his own constantly from that point onwards. Ansem and Xemnas sought to create their own version of Kingdom Hearts in their own shortcut ways, and Master Xehanort himself sought Kingdom Hearts because he believed the world had been thrown out of balance, and with its power, he could recreate the world as he saw fit, and he didn't care who he hurt to see that goal through. Yeah, the plot elements grew more and more complicated, and we have definitely experienced our fair share of stretching and molding the pre-existing canon in a way that skirts on retconning, but each game typically explained everything you needed to know, either through cutscenes or the secret reports of the game you were playing itself. But can you honestly tell me, right now in August of 2020, five years after his introduction to Kingdom Hearts Key, what is the Master of Masters' plan? Why did he write the Book of Prophecies? Why did he disappear? Why did he start the Keyblade War that destroyed the world in Kingdom Hearts Key? And then why did he start another one that nearly destroyed what was left in Kingdom Hearts 3? Who or what is Darkness? And what role do they have to play in all of this? Are they working with or against the Master of Masters? And how does Yuzora come into all of this? And for that matter, how does the larger mythos of the cancelled and reworked Final Fantasy vs. 13 play into the story of Kingdom Hearts? The simple answer is that, though we have received small scraps of information here and there, we simply don't have any hard answers for these questions yet. As said, the Xehanort saga is over, well, mostly, but I believe we have already taken our first steps into the next one. Yet we still don't have any real idea about what our main antagonist actually wants. Heck, we don't even know if he truly is an antagonist yet. But I truly believe there is a discernible sequence of events that we can look at and answer some of these big questions for ourselves. So today I thought we'd take a look at everything we concretely know so far and see what clues we can glean from these seemingly random and disconnected events. We're going to start with the Master of Masters, because I really do think he will be the launching point for whatever weird and wonderful places the series ends up next, and in future videos we can expand on the different subjects touched on today. So let's get started and dive in. This is my first attempt at analysing everything we have seen the Master of Masters do so far, and what that might tell us about his overall goals and future plans. Part 1. The Master of Masters Observable Actions To properly assess the Master of Masters' motives, I believe the first logical step is to look at everything he has done in the series so far. And to be thorough, we shall do this chronologically. I believe the first time that we see the Master of Masters, it is a little bit before the events of Kingdom Hearts Key have properly begun, and the Master has invited his apprentice Lushu to Daybreak Town Tower's control room to discuss the Master's past. It is interesting to note that he begins speaking exactly as Lushu walks in, and correctly answers some of Lushu's questions before Lushu has even begun asking them, almost as if he already knew exactly what Lushu was going to say. The Master begins by saying that the Keyblade War began when he was but a young boy, and through Lucia's questioning, reveals that it was fought between beings of light and beings of darkness in an unending clash. The Master did not have a Master of his own, and apparently fought alongside others like him, but in the Master's own words, they don't really count. The dark enemies he was fighting looked like himself and his allies, but the Master denies that they were human, and says that the description of monsters is rather appropriate. In the Master's mind, the Keyblade War officially began at the time when the Darkness took on the same form as the Master and his allies, and has been unceasingly waging ever since. Because the Darkness can constantly change form and hide itself, the war was never truly able to end, and the Master outright says that what he's about to do now is not an attempt to begin the Keyblade War, but rather an attempt to finally end it. The clash between the Foretellers and their loyal Keyblade wielders will destroy the Realm of Light, allowing Darkness to come in and consume everything. But the fragments of light in children's hearts cannot be destroyed, just like you cannot simply destroy darkness. But the Master says you can call a truce, and that this will give the Master a chance to take a break and relax for a while, leaving a bewildered Lushu to wonder how the Master can be okay with leaving the fate of the world in the hands of the Dandelions and the Union Leaders. Lushu also wonders if the Dandelions will at least be able to come home when the Master is finished with them, to which the Master simply responds, maybe not all of them, clearly implying that some will not be coming back. We now jump forward to the moment that the Master gave Lushu his role. At this point, the Master has already bestowed the new names and Keyblades upon the Foretellers, as well as their copies of the Book of Prophecies. 
As we know, Lushu now learns of his role to take the Master's Keyblade and the mysterious Black Box and travel with them into the future and observe all the events that are about to happen, primarily the dissolving of the Foreteller's relationship and the Keyblade War itself. Lushu departs with the Black Box and the Keyblade in hand, as the other Foretellers are given their roles, the roles which were specifically designed by the Master of Masters to drive the Foretellers apart and make the Keyblade War inevitable. While assigning Ira his role, the Master mentions that he isn't completely sure, but he may disappear. When giving Gula his role and the Lost Page, the Master seems to be reading his own copy of the Book of Prophecies, very interested and engaged by what he is reading. And when giving Ava her role, he also gives her a secondary copy of the Book of Prophecies and a list of names, special dandelions to select as his new Union leaders in the next world. After assigning the roles, the Master of Masters does indeed disappear without a trace, and is not seen again for hundreds, if not thousands of years. As the war begins at the Keyblade Graveyard, the Dandelions will all depart into the Data Recreation of Daybreak Town, and Lushu will follow to continue his observations. In the 11th Kingdom Hearts 3 secret report, Lushu notes that though the Keyblade War happened exactly as was written on the Lost page, one of the five new Union leaders is an imposter. Someone the Master did not choose. Is this as imposter represents a virus in the program the Master so carefully wrote, and that this virus will soon allow the five Union leaders to escape this world line that they have been trapped in something that Lushu believes to be a deviation from the Master's plan. Lushu doesn't even know how this can be possible, but passes on the Master's Keyblade as instructed, and ponders if even these supposed deviations from the Master's plan are actually what he intended to happen all along. Lushu observes in the Twelfth Report that in this new world line, and without the presence of the Foretellers or the Master, the being known as Darkness has arrived and begun a plot to destroy this world as well. But it is my belief that the Darkness has actually been operating under the radar for quite some time already. He is next seen again hundreds of years later, and though we haven't actually seen it yet, it is implied that the Master of Masters appears before the young Xehanort, seemingly right before Xehanort departs on his world tour, giving him the iconic black coat to ward off darkness. I imagine that we will see this original meeting in Kingdom Hearts Dark Road eventually, likely occurring chronologically before the graveyard scene that occurs four years after the adventure begins. We do see the pair meeting again after the world tour though, where Xehanort and the Master discuss the things that Xehanort has seen, Xehanort shows contempt towards those that he has met throughout his travels, believing that every heart contains darkness, and that the citizens' pretense of living peaceful, light-filled lives is a farce. The Master prods Xehanort towards affirming his growing worldview, and realizing that he should use his power to control the darkness and wield it to instill order among these potentially chaotic worlds. The Master also elects to tell Xehanort his name, and though Xehanort does hear what is said, the audience does not. Instead, we see the screen brightened by a mysterious light, as he says his name. He also tells Xehanort that he is one of the Lost Masters, likely still counting himself as one of the seven original Masters of Daybreak Town, along with Lushu and the Five Foretellers. Surely this would have sparked Xehanort's curiosity, given that we already know Xehanort was interested in the story of the Lost Masters, directly asking Ericus about them when he was a bit younger. And this is off topic, but perhaps Xehanort's knowledge of the Masters is connected to the memories Xehanort is evidently seeing from the ancient past. Anyway, 75 years later, Xehanort's own Keyblade War has concluded, and Sora has disappeared from the world, ending up in some sort of alternate reality version of the real-world Tokyo prefecture of Shibuya. It seems that Riku can temporarily travel to that same place while he dreams, and as he does so, he is watched over by Yozora from what appears to be the Tokyo Metropolitan Government Building. But from what appears to be the rooftop of the Square Enix Building, the Master of Masters makes his next reappearance. Taking a step towards the edge, he takes both of his hands, two perfect mirrors of each other, then flips the right one from being upside down to being matched up with its pair, forming a heart across the moon. Lushu writes in the 13th Kingdom Hearts 3 report that his long servitude has now finally come to an end. But now at last, the Keyblade War has begun and the Kingdom Hearts will open, a true and complete Kingdom Hearts, born of the clash between darkness and light. I will soon be reunited with my old companions, and in that moment, my long vigil will reach its end. He will return. Lucius seems to know that even this, the climax of Kingdom Hearts 3, will occur before it actually does. He accurately predicts that the four tellers will return, and given that he is now holding the Master's Keyblade once more, that surely implies that he also knew Xehanort would lose the war, and therefore, that Sora would rewrite time to ensure that outcome occurred. 
But what Lu Xu seems most excited about is that he will finally make his long-awaited return. And surely the person he's referring to here is the Master of Masters. Which says to me that he doesn't realize that the Master of Masters already returned relatively recently. A comparatively short 75 years ago. And for the Master's final appearance, it seems that we will likely see his return very soon. As trailers for Melody of Memory seem to show someone that could well be the Master appearing before Kairi in the final world. So what did we learn from this? And what assumptions or theories can we begin to formulate going forward? We learned that the Master of Masters thinks the Keyblade War actually began far before the one that began in both Kingdom Hearts Key and Kingdom Hearts 3, and has been waging ever since. It was fought between beings of light and darkness, and began officially as the beings of darkness demonstrated the ability to take on the same form that the beings of light appeared as at the time, which weren't necessarily human. At the time, the Master believed himself to be allied with the light, and despite everything he has done, we don't actually have confirmation that he has switched sides. The Master alleges that he doesn't know whether or not he will disappear, but we know that he does disappear, and he has only been seen two more times since. Once in the Keyblade Graveyard, and once in the same place that Sora reappeared in after also disappearing from the known world. In fact, it is a Chirithi, one of the Master's own creations, that tells Sora what fate will befall him. Is it possible that Ven's Chirithi knows what will happen to Sora because it has already seen it happen to the Master? The Master has been able to live an extraordinarily long life, implying that he is either a being that lives a far longer lifespan than a typical human, has either artificially extended his life by body hopping, or has spent a lot of his time in a place where the rules of time as we know them do not apply, similar to Aqua's time spent in the Realm of Darkness. The Master of Masters wanted to enact not one, but two Keyblade Wars, though in the first case, even though the Realm of Light itself would be destroyed, the Master made it imperative that the Light would survive. In the second war, well in the second war, if everything went as the Master evidently planned it, that he intended for the Light side to win, though not before the temporary corruption of Kingdom Hearts and by putting the world at great risk of being destroyed yet again. The Master needed Lushu to not only take the box, witness the events leading up to the Keyblade War, and pass that Keyblade on, but also to wait hundreds of years for the next Keyblade War and the Master's return. The Master not trust anyone else to wait there for him, or did Lushu's presence serve another purpose? Ira implies that Lushu summoned the Foretellers back. Did Lushu act as a waypoint for the Foretellers to travel through time? Is Lushu special, in the sense that it must be him holding the black box and the Master's Keyblade for the Master to return? And while we're at it, at some stage we'll have to talk about the black box itself. Lushu seems to have lost track of it over the years, to the point where he's sending Luke's sword out to look for it. Maleficent and Peter after it as well, believing that it contains a copy of the Book of Prophecies, but eventually resolved to the reality that it simply does not exist in this time, but that will apparently change after the Keyblade War. And of course, the Master needed to have everything that would ever happen recorded in the Book of Prophecies. But if he had an eye that could let him see into the future, why would the Master need to write it all down in a book? Apart from the fact that there would just be so much information to keep track of, what was the purpose of writing that information down and distributing it to others? It certainly wasn't useful in avoiding the Keyblade War. I mean, if anything, it guaranteed that the war would happen. So if the information wasn't written down for the Master's personal benefit, Perhaps it was written down explicitly so that someone, or something else, could read it. Allow me to piece together my current thoughts as to what this information has been pointing towards. This may absolutely be proven wrong in the future, but with the information we have established so far, I'm excited to hear your theories on it as well. For the time being, here's mine. Allow me a chance to establish a premise for you. Light, in its purest, physical, real-world sense, banishes darkness simply by existing. When you turn on a lamp in a dim room, the presence of light immediately forces the darkness to recede. Darkness, as a concept after all, simply describes a state that is in absence of light. But conceptually, one cannot exist without the other. Even describing one, you are pretty much forced to refer to the other. Light and darkness, as has often been described in the series, are two sides of the same coin. So if we have a being that refers to itself as a darkness, newly introduced to the series, allow me to put forth that this being is actually an avatar of the very concept of darkness itself. It is, in essence, something that represents the sheer embodiment of darkness itself, and exists purely to spread darkness throughout the world, and repel light, its natural opposite. But if darkness can exist as a physical being, is it possible that light can as well? The Master of Masters describes the Keyblade War as beginning when he was a young boy. He was a Keyblade warrior, he fought beings of darkness, and he had allies, though again, they don't really count. Is it possible that the Master and his allies are the equivalent force of light? Just light, if you will. Think for a second about the moment that the Master told his name to Xehanort, 
what will be shown at the exact moment his name is said. Light. But already many of you are saying, well hang on, how can the master be a force of light, yet also be responsible for destroying the realm of light and forcing his disciples throughout the years to use the power of darkness? I'm getting there. One sec. The master told Lushu that light and darkness have been waging war ever since he was a boy, and that what followed, i.e. the destruction of the world, may be what finally ends it, or at least cause a truce and allows the master to take a much needed break. Perhaps the master was willing to destroy the entire world just to call a temporary ceasefire, but I have a feeling he was up to something a bit more than that. Let us consider the Book of Prophecies. If we take what has been said about it to be true, then it contains a written account of everything that the master has seen while looking through his Keyblade, now carried by Lushu, with the final page detailing the grim ending of the Keyblade War. The master gives out five copies of this book to his foretellers, and asks that one copy also be given to one of the new Union leaders, whose name is written on this piece of paper. The names on the list are Ephema, Skald, Brain, Lorium, and Strelitzia, meaning that one of these five must have been the original recipient of the book. But because Ava knows what choice she has to make, and what will happen to the world if she does, she makes one conscious effort to defy fate, and instead of the person it was supposed to go to, instead chooses to give it to Brain. That means the Brain could not have been the one circled, and that the person was instead one of these four. I believe the darkness knew the intended recipient. Now I've talked about this before, but it is my current belief that the being we now know as darkness was somehow in control of the body of a Chirithi for the duration of Kingdom Hearts Key. Whether or not the Chirithi was corrupted, born that way, or somehow possessed, either way, darkness is in control of what we will refer to as Dark Chirithi. The Master asserts that the Keyblade War began because the Darkness found a way to assume the appearance of other beings. I feel like we may be witnessing that in the form of Dark Chirithi. Dark Chirithi's goal throughout Kingdom Hearts Key was to foster more darkness in the Keyblade wielders of Daybreak Town, and involuntarily get them to use the power of darkness while fighting Heartless, corrupting several wielders in the process. It could be seen as a key factor in bringing about the Keyblade War, as its discovery led to the Foretellers distrusting each other and believing one among them to be a traitor. It also stole light away from the wielders, making them bitter and resentful towards each other, even leading to them clashing keyblades in the streets over stolen lux. But its final act was to free itself from its Chirithi host. It claimed that by being struck down by its bonded wielder, the bonds between itself and its linked partner were now severed, and it was free to do as it pleased. Minutes after Dark Chirithi was struck down, Ven arrived at the abandoned warehouse, where the playable character and Skald had just been talking with Gula. Ven wandered in, believing that Master Arva wanted to speak to him, Strelitzia, who had been following our character's trail, also entered the building. And at this moment, I believe the now free darkness took control of Ven's body and used it to strike down Strelitzia, scooping up her green rulebook after the deed was done and receding back into the shadows. From here, darkness implanted memories into Ven's head, letting him believe that Master Arva had invited him to become a union leader, and the unknowing imposter joined the other four intended candidates, taking Strelitzia's place. Many of you I'm sure have reached this conclusion as well, but I believe that Darkness knew that Strelitzia was the intended recipient of the Book of Prophecies. As a Chirithi, it would have unparalleled access to all of the Daybreak Town Tower. In fact, Master Ira himself even says that he initially caught the Dark Chirithi sniffing around, clearly demonstrating that it was searching the tower. I believe that the Dark Chirithi saw one of the copies of the Book of Prophecies, and was able to read just enough to learn what it was supposed to do, or in a way, what it had already done to enact the Keyblade War. And it also read that Strelitzia would receive a copy of the Book of Prophecies in the next world. The Master of Masters described the war as this unending clash that would never resolve itself, with each side continually one-upping the other with their increasingly clever tactics. If the Dark Chirithi truly was an Avatar of Darkness, and it believed the Master of Masters to be an Avatar of the Light, then, perhaps it would have interpreted the ability to see through time and the creation of the Book of Prophecies as the ultimate trump card for the light side, a foolproof way of ensuring victory over the darkness by knowing every move that it would ever make. Ira found the Chirithi initially, therefore, it may have been sniffing around in Ira's chambers, getting a chance to read through Ira's copy of the Book of Prophecies that Ira himself was constantly reading. But now that it was discovered, the rest of the foretellers may well have been on high alert, and with its tiny Chirithi body, who knows if it was even strong enough to steal the book in the first place. But what a perfect way to interrupt the light side's plans, and instead gain a tremendous advantage for the darkness, than by stealing a copy of the Book of Prophecies for itself. And luckily for it, it had read that a copy of the book was about to be given to a brand new union leader. All it had to do now, 
was continue to spread the seeds of darkness throughout the Warriors of Light and wait for that destined moment to arrive. However, things did not go exactly to plan. Ava knew what the Master had intended for her to do, what the Book of Prophecies said that she would do, what therefore in the future Lushu must have witnessed her do, and made a change. Through the Master's creation of the Book of Prophecies and the knowing of what was to come, Ava changed the course of history, and instead of giving the Book of Prophecies to Strelitzia, instead decided to give it to Brain. So that leaves us with a conundrum. What happens when you know the future and make a conscious effort to do something differently? Does the Book of Prophecies change as a result? I absolutely do not know, but my current theory is probably not. Consider the last page of the Book of Prophecies. The foretellers read, as darkness itself may well have, that the fated land will be the battleground for a great war. Light will see defeat and expire, while darkness prevails evermore. Darkness prevails evermore, huh? Well, I'm sure any being of darkness would want to do whatever it could to ensure that future happened. But which Keyblade War is the final page referring to? Our choices are, well, either the original Keyblade War that the Master of Masters was talking about, the Keyblade War seen in Kingdom Hearts Key, or the Keyblade War seen in Kingdom Hearts 3, I suppose, are our three options. And given that the book itself is filled with characters, enemies, and stories that are demonstrably from the future, I would say that the war being described in the book is actually the Keyblade War from Kingdom Hearts 3. To back that up, consider that the Lost Page, which is said to detail the actions of the traitor, and Elushu's own words, also perfectly describes the Keyblade War from Kingdom Hearts Key. That page was torn out of the middle of the book. Therefore, the last page of the Book of Prophecies describes the original timeline of Kingdom Hearts 3. Sora and his allies arrive at the Keyblade Graveyard and are soundly defeated by Terra Xehanort. All seven lights fade, seeing defeat and expiring, while darkness prevails evermore. In fact, if we even take a listen to the quote from Xehanort's data battle, upon Xehanort's defeat, he utters a most curious line. This is not what was written. This is not what was written. This was your fate. Accept it. This was your fate. Accept it. To me, this says that Xehanort has either read or been told what is on that final page. But Sora committed a taboo of nature, abusing the power of waking to bring his friends' hearts back from the edge of oblivion, tearing a hole in the fabric of time and slipping through to an alternate reality, where Namine was able to contact Terra's lingering will and allow it to turn the tide in the battle against Terranaut. In this timeline, the light side won the final battle, and I would argue that everything beyond this point is now unwritten in the original Book of Prophecies, because this is a reality that was never supposed to exist. And what's interesting is that Terranaut may know, but young Xehanort and even Master Xehanort definitely seem to know that this will happen. So turning our attention back to Strelitzia's name being written as the intended recipient of the Book of Prophecies, I would argue that Arva's changing of fate has created a new timeline, just as Sora did when he changed his fate. A timeline in which the only difference that we can at this stage see is that Brain holds the book instead of Trilitia. But because Darkness also knew what was fated to happen, it was able to change fate itself and assassinate Trilitia, replacing her among the Union leaders with an imposter. In this new timeline, Darkness had also read that Maleficent will attempt to travel back in time, but the Master of Masters has prepared a data version of the Enchanted Dominion and guided her to that instead of her intended destination, trapping her so that she will not be able to enact any real changes or gain any knowledge that she shouldn't otherwise know. As Darkness escorts her through Daybreak Town, Maleficent asks Darkness how it can possibly know everything that is happening and just what it is. Darkness refers to itself as an old friend, but more importantly, to prove to Maleficent she will be okay when traveling through time without a body, Darkness admits that she exists in the future as written in the Book of Prophecies. So Darkness is admitting that it has read the book. When Maleficent asks if it knows what is written in the book, Darkness admits, maybe not all of it. And to me, the reason that it says this is because the future that it read said that Strelitzia would be holding a copy of the book, and she very clearly wasn't. Before long, I can only assume Darkness, which now has some doubts in its confidence of the things that is read in the Book of Prophecies, will either intentionally or unintentionally hide itself deep within the pit of Ventus' heart and vanish from the world for several hundreds of years as it travels through time. After finding Ventus and taking him on as his apprentice, Master Xehanort will extract all the darkness from within Ven's heart, including Ven's own darkness, plus the being of darkness itself, to create the guy that we know as Vanitas. Vanitas then unleashes its plague of dark beings throughout the worlds, spreading unversed into every world he travels to. 
Though Venetus' heart will travel forward in time to be fought as a seeker of darkness in Kingdom Hearts 3, it will return to its original place in Birth by Sleep and the story of that game as we know it in the Keyblade Graveyard. Venetus will be defeated by Ventus and rejoin with him, recompleting the young boy's heart, but effectively letting darkness settle back into Ven's heart, lurking just below the surface. I mean, if you think about it, Ven has only been awake for the equivalent of like a few days in the last 10 years, fighting in the Keyblade War almost immediately after awakening from his long sleep. The Keyblade War is now resolved, Sora disappears, and after what Riku considers to be a short amount of time, Terra trains Riku, but then as soon as that training is complete, Terra, Ven, and Aqua take off into the Realm of Darkness. This is probably the last place I would want to be if I was harboring a being of darkness within me. I hope those three are careful in there. So if we can accept that darkness, the being, has hidden itself within Ven for hundreds of years, then why are there still dark creatures lurking in the Realm of Light during the time it's away? Let's consider again that dark and light must exist in parallel with each other. You cannot simply extinguish one or the other from existence. So, perhaps this is why, in the years without a literal avatar of darkness plaguing the Realm of Light, darkness will start to sprout in the hearts of people, the weak who are hungry for power, and obtain it through intimidation and hatred. It seems like Xehanort observes this happening throughout Kingdom Hearts Dark Road, and it is said that the heartless are born from the darkness within one's heart. So perhaps we could think of the original pure Daybreak Town in the beautiful bright realm of light as being a ticking time bomb waiting to explode, because it was so pure and filled with light that it was completely imbalanced. Perhaps out of some sort of universal necessity, the being literally known as darkness manifested as a Chirithi and immediately began trying to rebalance the equation, and rebalance it did. By the time it was finished, not only was Daybreak Town destroyed, but the Realm of Light itself was completely shattered into tiny pieces, with each fragment forcibly isolated by a sea of darkness that kept them all separate. So, now I would argue that the balance had swung far back in the other direction, with the light barely clinging to survival. But as the Master of Masters said, you cannot destroy the light that lives in children's hearts. And over time, the worlds that developed were predominantly filled with light once more. But in a world so full of darkness, and darkness evidently still sprouting in people's hearts, what could possibly turn the tide and restore balance now? Well, consider what happened to Ven after he and Venetis clashed. Still harboring that being of immense darkness within him, Ventus' heart called out and returned to that place that it had taken refuge in once before, within Sora's heart. In a universe completely blackened by darkness, this small boy on his tiny island now harbored within him the literal avatar of darkness itself. A powerful, light-wielding Keyblade wielder had just been struck down. Two of his three light-filled pupils had vanished, and one had become corrupted by darkness. The land that master considered so sacred had been ruined, then lost to oblivion, and the world itself was nearly lost as the Keyblade itself was imperfectly forged. The foretellers were presumably all long still dead, and of course the master of masters himself was still nowhere to be seen. Perhaps now was the time for the universe to assist the light side. In response to the immense darkness within him, what if Sora was bestowed with extraordinary light-based power, the kind the darkness could never defeat, and in fact to this day never has? Sora has canonically never lost a battle to the darkness, no matter how mighty the evil that stood before him. The kid's practically not even 16, and has defeated countless strong heartless, Ansem, Xemnas, hell the entire organization 13 at least twice. Even when he did lose against a literal tornado of darkness, he just re round time and straight up cheated so that he could win. And in the face of a corrupted Kingdom Hearts and Xehanort wielding the true, completed Keyblade, he still managed to win the day. True, it did cost him his ability to stay in this world, but when all was said and done, there were now no more Keyblade Wielders of Darkness standing, and nine Keyblade Wielders of Light to watch over the realm. It seems the balance had shifted once more. And soon after, Based on Lushu's reaction, this was all planned out. Lushu knew that Xehanort would be vanquished, and the Master's Blade would end up back in his hands. Therefore, he, and by extension the Master, knew that Sora would rewrite time in order to ensure victory for the Light. The Book of Prophecies was wrong. Well, in one timeline it was right, but we'll get to that in another video. Light technically did see defeat and expire, but after literally hopping universes into a timeline where that didn't happen, darkness did not prevail evermore. Sora was banished to an unfamiliar land, but Yuzora was there waiting for him, with instructions to save Sora. It seems very possible to me that whatever trials Yuzora has been through have led him to be exactly where the Master of Masters wants both him and Sora to be. Yuzora will get his own video though, so we'll talk about him a bit later. 
So let's sum everything up. I think we are still lacking critical information to fully ascertain the Master's plan, but from what I have seen so far, I would not be surprised at all if the Master of Masters was some sort of being related to the Light. Combining Strelitzky's assassination by darkness with Arvis switching who was meant to be receiving a copy of the Book of Prophecies indicates to me that the entire purpose of the book may have actually been a trap to mess with darkness, maybe leading to its eventual defeat or a truce being called. The idea of a balance between light and darkness is something that's been rattling around in my head for a while now, but it sort of fits into another video I've been toying with, so I may flesh it out a little bit more then. I didn't even really touch on the black box, again that would be left for another time, but I wouldn't be surprised if whatever the box is ends up being in some way a way for the master to return to this world, permanently. And I think darkness also wants to get its hands on it, given the implication that darkness is sending Maleficent after it. I don't know if Luxord himself actually wants it, or if he simply is happy to play the part of Lushu's fool for the time being. But again, we might touch on him in the Azura video. And I didn't really find a way to work it cleanly into the script, but I feel like the Kingdom Hearts universe as we know it is about to get a whole lot bigger. Given the omniscient behavior of the Master of Masters, I get this weird idea that he may not even be from this universe, and this is just one of many universes he is keeping an eye on. Because let's say that this is a universe which, despite all the overwhelming odds against it, the Light has defied the fate that was destined for it, and the Light-wielding hero that saved the day has been snatched away, ending up in the exact same place that another, similar hero stands. Is the Master trying to assemble some sort of legion of the multiverse's mightiest warriors? Perhaps with an army of invincible video game protagonists that have canonically never lost an important fight, the light side will be ultimately triumphant in the unending Keyblade War that began all those years ago, when the Master was just a boy. Anyway, that is the video. <laughs> Thank you so much if you've made it this far, and I really hope to read your own theories and interpretations in the comments. The Master of Masters, again, like I said before, is just this ridiculously complicated topic that we honestly know so little about, so this video, I, I try not to make it like too divergent and scatterbrained, but there's just so much possibility to talk about that it's kind of hard condensing them all into one video, but if you made it this far, again, I want to thank you <laughs> for, for sticking with my train of thought. Melody of Memory is coming out in a few months, and between that and Dark Road, I actually imagine that we'll see a fair bit more about the next phase of Kingdom Hearts games pretty soon, and especially the Master of Masters. There will be plenty more to talk about, and I hope you consider subscribing to join me right here to do so. All the best guys, I'll see you real soon. Bye bye.